Good morning. Welcome back to Hope for Wondering Amish. This morning we have Ephraim Reno on again to continue his series of talks on his life's journey. I'm excited about this morning's talk to hear about Ephraim and his wife seeking and finding Jesus. I had to think of I had to think about Nicodemus in John 3 coming to Jesus in the night. No doubt Nicodemus had days of wondering who Jesus is, who it led him to wander through the night to find to find him. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's the same message for today, to be born of God's spirit, to repent of our sins and be born of God's spirit is so the message for us today. Um, we're also looking forward to hearing from that, our audience at the end. Um, so good morning, Brother Ephraim, are you with us this morning? I'm here, good to be with you. All right, why don't we get started? I'll have a prayer for you and then you can uh, get started a while. Father, I thank you for Brother Ephraim this morning. Thank you for his heart and his willingness to share with us. And we're so excited to hear what you have for us this morning. And I pray for your grace and your peace to be upon our brothers he shares. And we pray that this message could be used to advance your kingdom, to be an encouragement and conviction to many be to come to you and to be brought into your kingdom for your honor and glory. We bless your name. Amen. All right, well, thank you, Brother Elam. Appreciate your prayer there. It truly really is about him. First of all, as we get started here, I want to acknowledge six of my heroes this morning. Jesus, first and foremost, without whom none of these good things that I share with you could be true. And my parents who cared for me in many richly meaningful ways from conception to this very day. And for my wife's parents, who raised a very amazing person and welcomed me into their family as a son-in-law. And last but not least, but last but not least, my wonderful wife, Saloma, who has faithfully stood by my side through thick and thin, now going on our 20th year together. The journey I've taken, taken her on has not always been an easy one. Several disclaimers. The title this morning is From Broken Cisterns to Living Water. My experiences that I'm likening to broken cisterns is not a reflection on other members of the Amish communities. And not all my experiences were like broken cisterns. There were many meaningful, spiritually rich experiences in the things that I'm sharing this morning. And I didn't always handle things well in my years of searching. I didn't always see things rightly. So I'm relating to you this morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm relating to you as I saw things then, not necessarily as I see things now. And this talk isn't meant to stand alone. I would recommend you listen to the previous talks and the next ones as well. So I was born in 1983. Uh, in 1990, my dad was ordained as a minister in the Amish church, and seeing his his um, journey there, taking seriously his calling and preaching the word of God, taking Saturday afternoons to study the word and prepare himself, that made a good impression on my life back then. One thing I appreciate about my dad and didn't always appreciate as much as I do now, that my dad wasn't necessarily guided by the status quo. He did what he felt was the right thing to do, regardless of if that was the way most people did it. For example, daylight savings time didn't make much sense to him. And while most of the community observed daylight saving time, my dad looked at it as if there's daylight to be saved, well, first of all, daylight isn't really to be saved, it's to be used. And if you want to use it, you just get up early and get to work. So he never observed daylight savings time, although I would have, as a young boy, wish we would have just been like everybody else. But now I appreciate it. Another thing is my dad would not have any time for bywords 
um, words that were not uh, not good words. He would reprove us boys for. Maybe we heard the neighbor boys use certain words, and we would start using them at home, and my dad wouldn't have it. And I really appreciate that now. In 1995, my older sister, Annie, developed kidney failure and soon passed away. This was a time of deep searching for me and really wanting to do what's right, wanting to be the child of God. One day, as I was thinking on God and heaven and those things as a as a 13 year old boy, I was out in the produce patch working with the produce early in the summer. And I felt such a peace from God that I would be ready to go and be with him. And I actually, I felt such peace that I wanted to go. I wanted to just die right there and go be with God. And I remember laying down in the produce patch and just telling God, why don't you just take me right now? I'm ready to die. I want to go be with you. But if if now is not the time, if you want me to stay here, then I give you my life. Now, there were some years after that where I um, didn't have that peace and didn't have that closeness with God. But I always longed for that again after I didn't have it. In uh, 2001, my brothers and some neighboring boys and myself got into constructing farm silos. We traveled around from uh, community to community and family to family farm and um, constructed these silos. Generally, we would stay at the farm till we were done. And we'd stay there overnight, eat uh, meals with the family, and just uh, live with them. There were some families where it just seemed like the tension was so thick you could have cut it with a knife. And then there were other families where I just really, really enjoyed being there. There was joy, there was peace, there was love. And those experiences really stood out to me. There was a young family in Franklin County where we stayed a whole week and the, the young father had such a joy about him. At the breakfast table, he would get out the Bible and read the Bible and pray for us, pray for us by name. And he just had such a joy. That was that was uh, something I wanted. I didn't want to leave that place. There was so much joy and peace and love there. And I knew that what he had was more than what I had. And that we what he had, I wanted. Towards the end of our stay there, he asked me if I would lead in prayer. And having had the custom of only silent prayer, unless it was read out of a prayer book, this was definitely out of my comfort zone. And I declined. And later, I just thought, why couldn't I pray? If, if he prayed out loud, why couldn't I? And uh, I really desired to have what he had. Saloma and I got married in 2003. And that was a great experience and a start of a wonderful journey. But I had a lot of insecurities. I was a very insecure young man and had a lot of a lot of needs. I moved from my home community to my wife to her community. In her community, they were a little more traditional and there was definitely less money in the community. There was more of a, of a, um, perhaps a poverty and just being okay with that, living more of a simple life. And I, for a while there, I thought maybe that's where I would find more fulfillment. We started out our, our uh, married life in a very small old house. We paid $100 a month rent back in 2004. Today, that would be about $160. And I was okay with that. I kind of enjoyed that simple, humble life. But I found that there was, in that in itself, didn't hold fulfillment. For a while, I went on a big pursuit 
of health and I would read books on how to be healthy and I would really cut back on unhealthy foods and I would, I would get all excited about how to be more healthy, thinking that perhaps I could find fulfillment in that. I would read books on that. And uh, the one book that I was especially impressed with, I sent a letter to the editor and thanked him for the great book and how much I had to learn in it and how much it was helpful. And then he used part of what I wrote him as a review to sell his books in a popular newsletter. Uh, he did that without my permission. And I was, um, I was very, very embarrassed with the fact that he did that and he put my name with it. But there again, I found that just pursuing health in itself carries no fulfillment with it. I enjoyed hunting. I would hunt deer, especially every rifle season. My father-in-law and brothers-in-law and I would have uh, some woods that we stomped through and, and did a lot of hunting several years there. I really enjoyed it and, and uh, made out well. And then I got into reading books more and more. In the fall, my work would slow down. Throughout the winter, I would curl up in the house with my wife and perhaps a child or two and read good books. And I really, really enjoyed that. But hunting season came around and I just realized I would enjoy sitting in the house with a good book and read that. I would enjoy that more than going out hunting. So that's what I did. I dropped hunting and just read all the more books. But it seemed the more I learned, the harder I tried. The harder I tried, the more I failed. The more I failed, the emptier I felt. The more empty I felt, the more I sought for answers and read more. And I was on a journey. Life had a lot of ups and downs because of some deep insecurities that I had. Finally, in desperation, I decided I'm going to go to a, a neighboring county at a counseling center. I'm just going to drop in there. I'm going to go find some help. And that's what I did. I lined up a driver dropped in one morning said here i am i need help and uh, sat down with the with the one counselor and he started probing started asking questions how do you feel about this how do you feel about that what's your experience been um what's your what's the life you're living and he just asked many many questions that i had never been asked before and it was really hard for me to start looking into my heart and figuring out what's really there. He asked many, many questions that I just had no answers for. In the middle of getting all these questions that I certainly wasn't used to, I broke down. I, I, I was an emotional basket case. I, couldn't pray. He prayed for me and he invited me to start praying. I had never prayed audibly other than reading out of a book. And this was a new experience that I couldn't bring myself to do. I wanted to. And upon his invitation, I really wanted to and I tried, but it just wouldn't come out. It was like I couldn't make myself pray. Then he said, can you pray, God be merciful to me, a sinner? And I said that after him. And once I had said that, it seemed like something broke and I was able to keep praying from there. That was quite a breakthrough for me to be able to just pray audibly in front of someone. Now I had prayed audibly by myself, but certainly not in front of anyone else. After he saw what kind of emotional turmoil I was in, he felt like he probably shouldn't just let me go back home. So he scheduled a driver and had me taken to a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist uh, looked at me and, and uh, had me ask some questions, had me fill out some papers, 
and he gave me a prescription drug for uh, to cope with life. <clears throat> I don't remember what the name was of the drugs, but I took them home and I did not like them from the start. I knew that this was not the answer, but I started taking them anyway because I was asked to take them. But every pill I popped, the more I hated those pills, the more I was convinced that they were not the answer. About halfway through, I threw them away. I was not going to go this route. This was not the answer. I knew it. My wife and I went back to this counseling center, perhaps six or eight times as walk-ins. And we did get some answers to life. One of the things that was helpful was how they encouraged us to personal Bible reading and prayer and seeking the Lord. Um, and that, that was something I took to heart and did much more Bible reading after that. They did not go all the way on a lot of things that now looking back, they should have. They were very vague on the new birth, on cross bearing and so forth. But I was determined that what answers I got, I would put them to use and I would make it work. I didn't fit into the norm too well in that Amish community. I, I tried and I appreciated the community, but I traveled too much for work for one. I read too many books. I didn't do things just like everybody else sometimes without even thinking about it. Because of these things, I kept getting visitors from the, uh, the ministry team every so often. In an evening, as it was about getting dark, we would hear a clip clop, clip clop, horse coming in the road, and my heart would sink. Oh no, I'm getting getting uh, ministers coming to see me again. I must have slipped somewhere, messed up somewhere. Um, but that's that's the way it was. On the one visit, we sat down in the barn, sat down on some hay, and and we just had a nice little visit. And I kind of enjoyed it. And I started sharing some scriptures. I shared uh, Matthew 11, 28, 29, 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I was putting it in German. And, and I was just sharing how I was blessed with this scripture. And, and it was helping. It was helpful for me. And then I sensed that the ministers didn't really appreciate me sharing the scriptures with them. The comment was made that, Someone can get out of the scriptures whatever he wants. In other words, don't take the scriptures too seriously. That was a real disappointment to me. I, I expected more than that from the ministers, that they would be glad if I was taking the scriptures seriously. But instead of that, they, um, they tried to get me to back off, and I was very disappointed by that. About the same time, the bishop in my brother's church in another community began making unwelcome advances on, on my sister-in-law. He was a very respected bishop. I respected him. He was the one that had baptized me. I had looked up to him. When I heard this, I wouldn't believe it at first. I, I thought this wasn't true. It couldn't be. But I found out it was true. He did get excommunicated for it for a while, but as I understood it, he never really took the blame. He tried to shift it onto her, and it took something out of me as far as confidence to those in leadership. I found down within a growing disconnect, and I certainly had no intention of ever leaving the Amish church the community that I grew up in, the, uh, the, the faith, the way of life that I knew. I read many, many books, like I mentioned, and the comments were made sometimes. I, I was reading too many books, and there was a concern about it. Uh, reading books doesn't lead you the right way. People fall into strange things when they read books, and it was kind of discouraged, but I was very, very sure that in spite of reading so many books, 
it was not going to affect me in the wrong way. I was going to be a good Amishman. I was always going to stay there. But these books were helpful. I found them helpful. I found them ministering to me. And I couldn't get enough. I kept reading, kept reading. At about the same time, or, or throughout the same time, it just seemed like others were also feeling an emptiness and wishing for something more. For example, a traveling hybridologist began visiting the community. He would look you in the eyes and he would figure out what ails you from seeing what he could see in your eyes. And then, of course, you would have to buy his expensive potions and take them for whatever ails you. And it seemed like everybody and his brother went to see him, at first at least, which it seems like that points to an emptiness in, in uh, realizing that something was missing. At another time, a young man confessed to a moral failure in one of the members' meetings at church, and then the bishop opened it up to others to uh, if anybody else wanted to clear themselves of similar sins, they could confess that and ask for forgiveness. And again, it seemed like almost all the men were glad for the opportunity to get cleared up while the mood lended itself to it. And it was a little disturbing to me that uh, so many men were not living in victory. And um, it also... Um, showed me again that there's got to be something more is how i felt there's got to be something more as time went on i felt more and more that something is missing for a while the thought was i just need to go move away and find a better community a community i, I could move to where i could move to in peace and keep good connection with where i came from but a community that was more spiritual and those things. So I felt a growing emptiness. In uh, December of 2009, we attended a wedding of a co-worker of mine. I believe it was the last Amish wedding I have attended. We were very involved with the wedding since it was a close friend and I remember very distinctly just feeling such a tremendous emptiness there's smoking and joking going on over the evening hours square dancing and I just felt so disconnected and so empty and so hurting and so wondering what life is all about the other men my age were jostling around and carrying on. One of the traditions at weddings was that the young men that got married got married before that would get thrown over the fence. And it was all in fun. Uh, the, the idea was that you're not fully a man till you get thrown over the fence. And the ladies would have to step over a broomstick to become fully a woman. And I didn't get it. When we got married, I just didn't get it. I wasn't impressed by the idea. And somehow I never got thrown over the fence. And um, you can tell me sometimes my manliness falters. Maybe I, I still need to be thrown over the fence. What do you think? Um, but that, that wasn't me. I didn't really get into that. At that last wedding in December of 2009, that was going on. I was off in a corner somewhere in the dark, just hurting hurting, wishing for spiritual fellowship, wishing for meaning in life, wishing for fulfillment. Over that time, shortly after, I remember very distinctly in my quiet time with the Lord, I would pray and I asked God, lead me in the truth. Leave me in the truth, whatever it is, wherever it is, just show me truth and I will accept it and I will walk in it. I was burning within with desire for truth. 
and I didn't really know what I was praying for. I didn't know where it was. I still fully intended to not make any drastic changes, but I was starting to feel desperate enough that whatever the Lord would show me, I would do it. Very shortly after, on a Sunday, my um, wife and I were watching her grandfather while grandmother went to church. Grandfather was ailing in health and couldn't go anymore. So we were there and I browsed through my grandmother's bookshelf and I found a little booklet that she had gotten in the mail. It was a booklet of a printed sermon. And in the back, there were a lot more printed sermons available from the same ministry. And I decided I would go home. I would write this ministry. I would ask them to send me a bunch of these printed sermons and whatever else they had. I did that. I went home. I sent them a card. And uh, a while later, I got a brochure in the mail. Something that had caught my attention in this booklet was how these people took the word of God so seriously. They approached the word of God with the attitude that it has the answers to life. And all we need to do is receive it and believe it and walk in it. And we would find the answers in life. And that was so very attractive to me at that time. I was just aching for answers to life. And this seemed like these people were confident in the scriptures. And that was a confidence that I wasn't used to. But I, I got this brochure in the mail and I found in there a whole list of sermons. I could call in on the phone and listen to these sermons. Up to this point, I had never heard any preaching outside of my Amish setting. And the preaching was usually very repetitive. And people would sleep through church a lot. The preacher one time reproved the people for sleeping so much through his preaching. And I felt bad for him. I agreed with him. And at the same time, I thought if the preaching was just more powerful, people probably wouldn't be sleeping. But there, as I pondered, should I listen in to these messages? Should I not? I knew that my people would say, definitely don't listen to it. You get deceived. And I didn't want to get deceived. But I thought, I've read the Bible enough. If it is deceiving, surely I can catch on to it. That is deceiving. And I went fear and trembling to the phone shanty and stood in there. And the first message I, I wanted to listen to was on excommunication and shunning, because that was a huge thing in my mind. If I did anything drastic, I would be excommunicated. And I was taught that 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 would, that would uh, I would not, not have any hope if I would be banned from the Amish church. And that was a, a very big question I had. I didn't want to be banned for sure not that would that would have been very terrifying to me so i listened to that message and i was spellbound the preaching was quite different from anything i had experienced again very plain preaching out of the word of god bringing answers to life i was spellbound i couldn't get enough i listened to one message after the other work was slow at the time sure there were things i could have done but there was nothing I rather would have done than just drink in the word of God and find answers to life. And I would listen and listen and listen. For several weeks, I did that. After several weeks, I had this distinct feeling that something big was about to happen in my, in my life. I finally got the courage to call a brother whose phone number was on that brochure that I had. And as I poured out my questions and longings to this brother, the big question for me was, do I need to leave or should I stay? And he very wisely said, well, that's not really the question to look at right now. What we need to do is, are you born again? Are you right with God? And he asked me that question. 
I said, I think so. I've been baptized. I'm a member of the Amish church. I think so. Then he asked me, was there ever a change of heart? And I said, no, I don't think there was. And he said, I think you need to be born again. I had often heard the scriptures on the new birth, and I believed them. But what I heard along with that then was, you can't really know if you're born again. You do what the church says, and you live right, do the best you can, and hope you're okay. Now, what I was hearing was something very different, that you could know the Lord, and you could know that you're a child of God, and you could know that you were born again. And I really, really desired that. To this point, I had not shared much of my searchings with my dear wife. It was a pretty scary thing to be questioning the whole package that I had grown up in. It was a very, very scary thing. And part of that was um, just the idea that you were questioning things really put you on the spot, really got you marked where people would look at you in a very different way. So that that's why I wasn't free to share with my wife. I um, rather wanted to check things out on my very own in a private way till I figured out what was what. When I talked to this brother on the phone, he said, we'd be happy to come out and hold a Bible study with you. Uh, but where's your wife in this? And I told him I haven't really shared with her. Uh, that was on a Saturday. Actually, church was to be held at our place the next day. That was a very big day. You have a lot of, of uh, people staying all day for supper into the evening. Friends and family would stay. Uh, it was a very big day, and I sure didn't want to drop such a big thing onto Saloma the day before church was at our place. So I waited till Monday morning, and then I shared with her what I had been doing. I was listening into these messages, and um, of course, that was that was a big a big no no in our setting. Uh, Saloma knew that I was wrestling very deeply and struggling very deeply. And she cared very deeply that I would I would find the help I needed. I shared with her that these people seem so genuine. They they preach the word of God in such a clear way. I would really like to learn more. They would like to come out and hold a Bible study with us. Would it be okay? And it was a great struggle for her to open herself up to that idea. But at the same time, she knew I was struggling very deeply and um, and gave the okay for that. So I went back to the phone. I called called the brother, said, said uh, Saloma says, you can come, and I'd like for you to come. When can you come? And they came out that very evening, and we had a, a very amazing Bible study in presentation of the gospel. It wasn't like it was anything new. It wasn't like I hadn't heard it before. But it was it was presented in a clear way, in a in a way that I could personally accept, and in a way that there was, you know, there didn't have to be this question hanging over your head: Are you right? Aren't you? Are are you? Do you have peace with God or don't you? Are you a child of God or aren't you? Are you born again or aren't you? And and having been instructed very carefully that you cannot know that was a very very big thing to me can i know or can't i and i desperately wanted to know that evening i accepted the gospel i accepted the lord jesus as my personal savior i don't know looking back whether i had been born again before that I tend to believe that when I was 13 years old, 
when I had such peace with the Lord, when I would have been very happy to die and go to heaven right there, I tend to believe that that is where I would have gone and that I was right with God at that time. I, I don't think that was fake at all. I believe it was very real. But then I, I backslid. I lost that peace. All those years went by. And there's great turmoil within. And I was able to just confess my sins, cry out to God, believe in the Lord Jesus, and experience a glorious peace. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. That was such a wonderful evening. And I, I knew for sure that whatever God calls for me to do, it's going to be worth it. I'm just going to do whatever he leads me in. And, and there was such a burning desire for spiritual fellowship in such an undeniable way that I had to reckon with. Well, these folks really took, a, took, a, uh, took it upon themselves to minister to us, to disciples. We had Bible studies once or twice a week for almost two months. Uh, after the first several, we knew that we couldn't keep doing this in secret. So we started sharing with, with our parents and others that we were having these Bible studies. We were having very deep questions about our way of life, our religion. And um, as could have been expected, there was, there was a great deal of opposition to the uh, approach that we were taking. The first Sunday that word was out that we weren't uh, sure if we would stay with our Amish people. We knew that we would probably get a lot of visitors that day. So we made the choice to go visit the Effort of Christian Fellowship that day rather than stay at home and, uh, and get these visitors. It was an in-between Sunday anyway, where we weren't expected to go to church and we weren't really up to getting a lot of opposition at that point, we really desired to go and, and uh, see what this church was all about. And that's what we did. And I think it was probably a good move. Um, I, I think it was the right thing to do. I'm not sure. But it, it was quite amazing to experience that. A young Amishman coming to this church and, uh, and um, it being quite a stretch from anything I had ever been used to. And I don't know if you can relate to some of my turmoils that day as I was, as we were getting closer and closer to the church house, I was wrestling very deeply with my hat. I brought my hat like, like a good Amishman and I was wrestling, should I wear my hat into church or should I leave it outside? And that was one of the struggles. And there was many, many, many things like that that I I was wrestling through. And I didn't know. I didn't know what was right, but I was trying to do what was right. Uh, I don't remember what I did, if I left my hat in the van or if I took it in. But one of the things I really remember that just made such an impact on me was the the preacher his demeanor as he preached the word. I don't remember a lot of what he preached about that day, but I sure remember his smile. I was used to that the preacher just didn't smile. Our preachers didn't smile in church unless maybe they couldn't keep a straight face. For instance, if if a cat got into church and disrupted the service, or if a child fell backwards off the bench and the minister couldn't keep a straight face, then uh, that's the only time he would smile and here the preacher got up and he was just beaming all the way through his message. And it really, really spoke to me, the joy that he had. We got lots and lots of opposition for those several months. Um, and I want to assure you that our people really cared. They weren't against us. They were for us. They really believed that what we were doing was, was um, damnable. And we were getting into heresy and that we would enter a slippery slope right into the world and into hell. They really believed that. And they wrote us stacks and stacks of letters. We, we got company day in and day out. Some of our more intense days, we had company all day long and into the night. The next morning, we would be sleeping in because we got to bed late. 
and we would hear knocking on the door again and the same thing all day long again. It was a very intense time, but I, I'm actually thankful for the opposition that we got. It, it really drove me into the word to find out what is reality, what is true, that this was serious. It wasn't something to be, to be done lightly. And I did a lot of searching, a lot of praying, a lot of, of uh, seeking the Lord. And like I said, we had many, many Bible studies once a week, sometimes twice a week, where the folks from Africa Christian Fellowship would come out and read the Bible for us and talk about it and pray with us, sing with us, fellowship. And it ministered to my poor heart in a way that I cannot describe. It really did. And then there would be such a contrast where our people would come and, and just discourage us and create a lot of doubts in our hearts. And uh, when they left, we felt so down and discouraged and depressed. And again, just wondering, are we doing the wrong thing? Are we deceived? But the, uh, the uh, turmoil and discouragement that I would face with that, and then the enlightenment and the encouragement and the spiritual edification that I would experience when we had believers come out. And some of these believers were, were in the band where I should have been shunning them, not letting them into the house, not letting them sit at the same table, for sure not letting them talk to me about anything about God. Some of these I was getting ministered to in very deep ways that I just couldn't deny. After two months of this, things came to a head. On a Saturday, our dear ministry team came in and asked me to come to church the next day with a decision of what we're doing. Are we staying or are we leaving? And I wrestled very deeply that day with God, realizing that if this was a bad move, it was it was way too big of a move to be making if it was a bad move. And I just struggled. I took the Bible. I went off on my own to, for some quiet time and just prayed and sought the Lord. And God very clearly in a in a miraculous way took me to Second Corinthians twelve nine. My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. When he brought that verse to me, and it was done in such a way that I just knew this was from God. I knew it. And it touched my heart so deeply. And I just rested in the promise that his grace would be sufficient. And I could move forward in faith and do what's right and allow his leading to take me where he wanted me to go. The next day, I went to church. My dear parents came and went with me to church in support of, of, uh, of course, they were, they were wanting me to stay, but they went for my support. My wife's parents came also and went with me as well. Saloma couldn't go, go because uh, we had a new baby in the house, about two weeks old. So she stayed at home with the baby and uh, her mother stayed with her. My parents and my father-in-law went with us to church. It was a very emotional day for them very hard day for me. I had wrestled through things in such a deep and clear way that there was no turning back. Where he leads me, I will follow. I've decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. And I had perfect peace about it. I was put in the van that day, and the thing which previously would have terrified me, now I had perfect peace about it. Saloma was the same way. It had taken her longer to process things, partly because I hadn't brought her along in my searchings, and I had I had done a lot of searching, done a lot of wrestling before I ever shared with her and brought her along. But in the several months of, of Bible studies, of searching, uh, she also had 
work through things. And I would love to go into more detail there. Um, one of the things that she would, that she um, finally worked through was witchcraft that had been practiced in her family, um, extended family, pretty involved in witchcraft. I had been involved in a little bit of it, but not as deeply as what she was. And she was, I could say, innocently um, brought into it, but it had a grip and a bondage in her life that once she was able to identify that and renounce it and, and, uh, and turn away from it, she found that same perfect peace. This was just several days before we were excommunicated. She had been un unable to see her way through that before having renounced witchcraft, but once she had renounced that, just cast it off and trusted in Jesus, then she also found perfect peace in being excommunicated. Shortly after, the whole van load of our close relatives, uh, her parents, her uncles and aunts, people that loved us and cared for us deeply, decided to make one last effort to come and, and uh, bring us back. Our neighbor was the van driver. He was sympathetic to this, some of the stands we were taking. And he, against their wishes, he informed us that he was bringing a van load of folks to, again, uh, oppose us, the direction we were going. And he felt like it was fair for us to know about it. Otherwise, we wouldn't have known about it. And it was through the day where generally I would have been at work, but today I wasn't. And um, I was... I was weary. I was, um, I felt like I had enough conflict. I wasn't really up to facing more conflict. And we made the decision to leave so that when they come by, we wouldn't be there. And um, I left a note on the door saying that we were just tired of going in circles with these arguments. And that if they would bring the Bible, they would be welcome to come back again. And we would reason out of the scriptures. Though I meant it well, it uh, it didn't go down well that we intentionally left when they were coming. That's one thing that I would do differently now. I really wish that we would have stayed there and just heard them out and shared with them what we had found and have a gracious yet firm stand for the Lord. I believe that that would have been much better than the way that things went from there. It, it just seemed like that was a punch in the stomach for them. And I have gone back and I have apologized for it. Uh, but I, it's still, that, that's one of the regrets. There were so many unknowns that uh, there were many things that, I would do differently if I was walking through those times again. But um, those are things that I have to leave and move on. As I look back over my life, I see God's mercy woven throughout all the way. And truly to him be glory and honor and power forever. He is worthy. There were so many physical protections over the years where my life could have been snuffed out so many times so easily. Uh, just one example, and I know I'm I'm uh, going kind of long here. Uh, there's so many things that I would love to share, and I just got to move on. But um, one of God's protections that was pretty amazing, my wife and I were coming home from her parents, and uh, our little road came off of the main road at a where the main road made a slight bend to the right, our road made a slight bend to the left. There was a Y there. Our horse, his name was Thunder, and he was he was quite a character. He had a mind of his own. If he thought he knew where he was going, he would really try to go there. And he wanted to go home, so he was sure he would need to turn in this road. But I was not going home right then. We were still going off to another neighbor and then going home. So a truck was coming from behind and passing us at a pretty good rate of speed right when thunder decided that he needs to dart into our road. So he darted right in front of the truck and the driver handled it 
super well. He very quickly steered off into the little side road at much too high of a speed, but he steered off into the little side road, came down to a stop, turned around, came back out and, um, and passed us. As he passed, he bumped his horn a little bit, letting us know it was all right. But that was, that was a time where uh, we could have so easily been hit by that truck. Another time at work, uh, I was using used fall protection that I had just gotten from somewhere. And after I had hung off of it, the crack was discovered in the, and the hook was taken apart by hand very easily. And I was just hanging on that high up in the air. There's so many instances like that, that, that God's mercy is just so amazing. And, and uh, I praise him for it. I thank him for it. And he gave us what we needed when we needed it all throughout our journey in amazing ways. The spiritual guidance is so precious and so, so uh, amazing. There are so many other details I could share with, with you this morning, but I will stop there. And next time I would like to share with you the things that we have found since our conversion and leaving the Amish. You know, the journey that we have had since then, it's been about 14 years. We've had many ups and downs. We've learned many things the hard way. We've learned many good things. We had many high ideals when we left that didn't necessarily hold out, but God's way is always best. And as as he, as the Bible says, he chastens those that he loves. And he has done that for us. But his love has been so real, and I just look forward to sharing with you our continued journey. To him be all the honor and glory. Brother Elam L., hand it back to you. Well, Brother Ephraim, that was really good and very refreshing to hear your story. I mean, what a battle you and your wife went through. I just had to think of the verses in John, what's in John 10. Uh, yeah, John 10, 10, the thief does not come come to except to steal, kill, and to destroy, but but I have come that you may have life and may have it more abundantly. So I'm so thankful for the journey that you had, that you found that abundant life. But we want to open it up to our audience also. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you. I'll click uh, settings here. You'll be able to unmute yourself and uh, yeah, we want to hear from you. So we're looking forward to your questions or comments. So how fa far of a journey did you have from your house to Ephrata, Ephraim? It was about two hours. You didn't do that with the horse and buggy, did you? No, I didn't. <laughs> For a while, there would be brothers, families that would come out and give us a ride. So they had two hours out to us, two hours back to church. And then again, two hours to take us home and two hours back home. So there was some very loving dedication there to help this uh, young Amish family that was seeking. Yeah, well, thank thank the Lord for sending help to you. Yeah, so if you have any questions, please ask Ephraim or any comments, please share. We look for you had also mentioned about you putting a lot of time into seek the Lord and I guess further ahead than your wife and it took a little more time for her to uh, come along or catch up or I'm not sure how you worded that but I think that's fairly common with husband and wives the husbands um, perhaps are quicker or can make changes easier the wives tend to uh, like the security they're a tend to be maybe a little more afraid of the change and uh -huh. leaving families behind. Yeah, that that would be a, definitely be a very good uh, discussion uh, at some point. Yeah, you should be able to unmute yourself uh, if you have any questions or comments. Yeah, thank you for sharing, Ephraim. Am I on? 
Uh, yes, yes you, are. you are. Yeah, thank you for sharing. I really enjoyed uh, listening to all this again. And uh, I don't really have any questions, but just want to let you know that I really appreciate it. And I remember coming to your house one weekend and seeing all those books and and uh, questioned a little about it myself. But now that uh, uh, we came to understanding, or I did anyway, I really, really appreciate that and really appreciate your journey and and your help in my journey and really look forward to your sharing it, sharing this more. And and uh, I just want to thank you for all that. Yeah, thank you, Brother David. It's a joy to share these things. And really it is only possible because of Jesus and his drawing power and the work he has done. And I appreciate uh, your journey as well. Amen. Yeah, thank you very much for yeah sharing, David. I really appreciate that. Yeah, if there's no one else, I guess we'll um, uh, close our meeting here. We'd love to hear more questions or comments. If anyone else wants to share. All right, I guess we'll meet again in two weeks. Is that the plan, brother? Amen. All right. Well, God bless each one of you on the journey you are on, and we'll plan to see you back in two weeks. Thank you. God bless. Guide me, oh, the great